Good evening to everyone and welcome. This is Jennifer Reynolds. I am in Tampa, Florida. I am the sales manager in the state of Florida for Scenic Tours and Cruises. I've been in the travel business all of my life. And for the last week, I've been kicking around home and thinking about ways to connect with people and kind of get lost in the world that I love so very much. So welcome to my Armchair Traveler series. Every night, 7 o'clock for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Until the end of the month, every night I'm going to present something different to you, a little escape. Instead of watching the television, let's take a look at our world. Let's take a look at these amazing opportunities that really are here in front of us. And do take a look, Jennifer Reynolds Travels. I'm going to post some stuff up there because to travel is to live. Many of you are travel agent partners of mine or people that are diehard travelers like I am. And we all know in the world there is a difference between travelers and tourists. And I do like to consider myself as a traveler. But I have been working in this industry all of my life. I was born and raised in Canada. Tampa, Florida is home for me. And I spent 16 years of my life, wonderful time of my life, living and working on board cruise ships. Uh, first, I was on board as a rep for a Canadian tour operator. I worked in the purser's office. I went to shore excursions, and yes, I was part of a duo juggling magic act for a bunch of years. But I spent 18 very, very happy years at sea, and it's here where I really discovered how to travel, where I discovered that travel was as important to me as breathing, uh, that the choices that I was going to make in my life were going to allow me to go to different places around the world. Now, I got a little message there that my voice may be going in and out. So I have a microphone and I've pulled it just a little closer to my mouth. And I hope that that might be a little bit clearer. So, you know, so many of us are going through so much right now. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to connect. And in the last year, I had a chance to go to Africa on the left-hand side, Tanzania. That upper right photograph was taken in Australia, in Melbourne, in Australia. And thanks to a wonderful man I spent a lot of my years with, no, not the juggler unicyclist. I did get rid of him to pick up a PhD oceanographer when I worked on ships. Uh, but recently I had the chance to go to the Antarctic and I stepped on the seventh continent and it just reignited my deep desire, my deep passion for travel and really my desire to want to share it with you. So this evening, welcome to Ecuador, what I love to call a country of contrasts. And that photo on the right hand side, I just lost that Helen Kaminsky hat last week or a few months ago, actually. But take a look at my belt. That's not a camera on my belt. Folks, for those of you who have been in the business as long as I have, that would be called a Blackberry. That's when I went down the first time to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and I'm going to share the experience of having been in Ecuador and also a lot of what the Galapagos Islands really have to, to offer. I became really fascinated uh, with Ecuador working for an Ecuadorian company. So I had a chance to go down and spend a lot of time with my mothership down in Quito in Ecuador. And what I discovered was that uh, the, the country itself is only the size of Colorado, but the Republic of, of Ecuador is named for its location on the equator. And it's truly a land that's really remarkable in diversity, both ecologically, culturally, and a lot of folks just don't know anything about it. Uh, ecologically, you're going to look at four very distinctive ecosystems. And that's all within the borders of this one country. You've got Peru up to the north-hand side. Uh, the Amazonian rainforest, which is opening hugely to travel right now, also called the Oriente. Uh, of course, you can get into the Amazon in Peru as well, but Ecuador has a very diverse culture here. The Andean Mountains, which run down the spine or the Sierra, and the coastline, uh, that long period that you have on the coastline as well. Ecuador is a very, very uh, long coastline there with Peru surrounded by Colombia. And of course, the Galapagos Islands as you get a little bit further out into uh, the Pacific. But it's predominantly a Roman Catholic country. The population's about 15 million, and my friends, one third of them are considered poor. Uh, Ecuador is home to 50 different indigenous groups, and that makes up about 40% of the population. And a lot of these indigenous groups are going to be up into the Andes Mountains. A lot of the folks here are mestizo, which is a mix of European, and so that would be the Andalusian, as well as, as the, the Castilian. And you'll find that 
throughout Peru and, and so much of, of Central and South America, but that Amerindian uh, ancestry. But there's 10% of Ecuador's population is of European descent, Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. And believe it or not, there's actually a small um, African influence, which goes back historically, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But at the time of the Spanish conquest of South America, a lot of what was present day Ecuador was under the Incas. And y'all know what that Inca empire is. But the Incas, uh, they were like conquerors to the Spaniards. Now they took over what cultures that had previously existed. They didn't absorb a lot of the old stuff. They simply imposed their rules upon them. So there was still some indigenous peoples that were left behind in some of that culture. But most people, when they look at this country, they think a lot exclusively of the Incas, but we have to go back a lot further than that. Um, this is prehistoric Las Vegas culture, primitive culture that was 6,000 years before Christ. They were all along that coastal area of Peru and, and uh, up into Ecuador as well. These were some of the earliest cultures to live in South America. And this has a lot of the bearing on the story of South America, of, of, of the mountains, of the Andes, and how things were settled. Maize was a very big thing. Uh, the early cultures, they were always working with maize. And there was a lot of remains of many human skeletons have been found along the coast. And this is especially along the edge of, of Guayaquil. Now in the highlands towards present day Quito, which is the capital of the country, Quito is at a much higher level of altitude. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's almost 5,000 feet in altitude. But there's been some prehistoric cities that were discovered here. They've been excavated and we know that human populations go back as far as 8,000 years before Christ. Now the Inca Empire was the largest pre-Columbian civilization and it was likely the most advanced but y'all, it wasn't the only one. A lot of times when people start looking at the countries here, they always think of the Incas and there's so much more. Um, but the domination of the Incas and the Spanish over a lot of the people in, in indigenous Ecuador, this is what allowed the country to survive. Now it's the descendants that can attribute their links back to these ancient cultures. Now, whether it's the Incas, whether it's the Las Vegas tribes. Now, when the Spaniards came over here and first sighted the coast of Ecuador, it was in the 1500s, and they did not have good things in mind. It was purely for conquest. They were here in Ecuador in 1534, and they had just finished doing whatever it was going they were doing with the Peruvians. So they were just moving a little bit south. In 1534, the Spaniards founded the city of Quito. It's called the City of Eternal Spring. Guayaquil which is on the coastal level, was founded in 1535. And Cuenca, which is kind of a cool place, it's a really neat colonial spot, was much later in 1557. But uh, Cuenca has been devastated by a tremendous amount of earthquakes recently. Well, and when I say recently, I mean in the last century. But it was really the diseases that were brought by the Spaniards. You know the story, the smallpox, influenza, diphtheria, and measles. Don't we all know this story well? It killed more of the native people than it did with the soldiers, and there was just no resistance to any of this. So much of the land and the people of Ecuador, everything was shared out among the Spaniards. They owned the large estates, and it was the natives that were working the lands. And the Spaniards also brought in folks from Africa to do the work on the plantations. So today, when you go into this country, it's not uncommon at all for the Ecuadorians to find mixed race Spanish some native South American and even some African as well. In the 16th, 17th centuries, Ecuador was part of the voice royalty of Peru, but it was in 1563 when they were finally allowed to have some autonomy. Quito, and there she is, at that altitude of 9,300 feet became the uh, center, became the capital, and it really, really prospered. It did very well at 9,000 feet. It's called the City of Eternal Spring. It's almost like it's always spring here. The weather is very, very predictable. It's very easy to get around, and it really has a wonderful quality of life that's going on here. But it was in the late 18th century, early 19th century, the folks in Ecuador did not like the Spanish rule, and in 1809, there was an uprising that took place. You know the name Simon Bolivar. He came in here. His uh, lieutenant, Antonio Jose de Sucre, and if you think of the name Sucre and uh, attach that to some of the currencies that exist in South America, 
they won a very major battle in 1822 when that was in Pinchincha. And that battle actually took place on the edge of a volcano and Pinchincha today is still an active volcano. It's over 11,000 feet. There's a lot of rattling and rumbling that goes on there. Ecuador is still very active from a volcanic standpoint. If you go back and read the news, lots of times that Pinchincha has caused a little bit of stress in uh, the city of Quito. But here's what happened to Ecuador at this point in time. And again, we're talking in the 1820s. Ecuador became part of Colombia with Simon Bolivar, you know the name, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Panama, Northern Peru, and Brazil all formed one nation. But in 1828, Ecuador went to war with Peru over a common border. And this territorial dispute has been a source of conflict, complete with violent protests and some very deadly military clashes for over 150 years. And it actually wasn't until 1998 when Bill Clinton stepped in and they had a signing of a treaty. And Bill Clinton said this, quote, this signing marks the end of the last and the longest running source of armed international conflict in the Western Hemisphere, unquote. And that was just in 1998. But in 1830, Ecuador withdrew from the group and they became their own. They became the Republic of Ecuador. Juan Flores became the first president of Ecuador and in 1851, slavery was finally abolished in the country. And then in 1867, oil was discovered and it became a country major export. And there has been a lot of territorial disputes and a lot of issue regarding the oil. It has been a very economic room boom, but it's also been a very sore point uh, particularly with the borders and how some of the exports are working over in this part of the world. But then there was a president that was brought into power. And this gentleman, he was born, Rafael Correa was his name. He was elected president in 2006 and he was president until 2017. So he had a pretty darn long run. Born in 1963, the same year that I was, he was born in Guayaquil. He is an observant Roman Catholic, as is the majority of the country. He's a Christian leftist and a proponent of 21st century socialism. So things got really interesting here in the country. But he did really, really well. His wife was from Belgium. Uh, he had a master's degree in economics, a PhD as well, and he was really good for the country. And the country has continued to prosper. It's continued to do fairly well more cruise ships are calling into the ports of Manta, of course, along the coast. Uh, a lot of exports come out of, of the country here, uh, including cocoa, beans. Uh, I was surprised to discover the next largest exporter of cocoa in South America was actually Brazil. You know, they grow a lot of coffee, export a lot of flowers out of Ecuador as well. And <laughs> interesting though, if you go to visit the country, it is the lousiest coffee you'll ever have which is not uncommon in many of these South American countries because they export uh, the better brands and the better bits of coffees that they've got as opposed to using them uh, within the, the country themselves. So they'll export some of their better stuff that goes along. Uh, cocoa goes out, there's coffee, a tremendous amount of color. There's a tremendous amount of creativity in the country of Ecuador. So many people will live in the Andes Mountains and you'll find this in Peru as well. People that have had a really hard life. These are the Mestizo folks. They may come down to the coastal areas. You may see them up in the Andean areas as well. And very often simply by the color of the clothing they're wearing or the style of the clothing that they are wearing, you can tell which part of the mountains or which particular tribe or culture that they may belong to. And again, that's something that can be very, very interesting um, throughout all of these Andean cultures. Uh, most of the Peruvians and Ecuadorians who live in the highlands raise guinea pigs. Don't worry, it's called cuy. You do see it quite regularly. It's not uncommon for homes, particularly in the highlands, to have the delicacy of what you and I would call guinea pig, but is truly a delicacy in some of these, these uh, high-level countries. Again, Ecuador, Peru as well and they're served for special occasions and also on holidays as well. The mountains of Ecuador play a huge role, of course, uh, not only in the split of peoples because you have the Amazon on one side 
uh, that goes down to the ocean on the other side of the country. We've got our flat river, our flat uh, piece along the ocean that will take us out to the Galapagos Islands. But something that has been strategic here along the coast has been the presence, a U.S. military presence, for a very significant reason. And it plays a very important role in Panama. Uh, it plays a role in the Galapagos Islands, and it plays a very important role here in Ecuador as well. And that is really the presence of a U.S. military base or a U.S. presence somewhere. Um, when the Panama Canal was turned back to Panama in the end of 1999, there was no more U.S. military presence in Panama. So they had wanted to move out of Panama to other areas to have a presence, a U.S. presence. So in 1999, the U.S. Air Force located to Manta, Ecuador. And this was the first time that an Ecuadorian territory had been used by the U.S. military. There have been some other ships who'd come in here before. Uh, Captain Porter, he was an explorer. He was on the Essex. He's the son of a gun that's responsible for letting goats go on the Galapagos Islands. He was responsible for that. But he brought some military presence into the coast. But the fact that um, we had this military base on Manta was a really big deal. Because in World War II, the U.S. set up an army base in the Galapagos Islands on Seymour Island, on the island of Baltra, known as North Seymour. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But what most people don't know is that the U.S. had built that base in Galapagos to keep an eye on the Panama Canal. So there was a base in Manta, there was a presence in the Galapagos, and it ultimately was that military base that opened up the Galapagos to tourism. But if you're looking along the coast here, there is a lot to see. There's small towns, a lot of small villages, and the way of life here is many of the markets, and they are very, very colorful. A lot of handmade items here. People are very creative in the ways that they're going to make their living. And for tourists that are coming to the country now, many will go to the highlands, but many more are coming to the coast, where you can get out and do a lot of fishing. There's a large expat community now, and some really nice accommodations uh, along the beaches, and some pretty exquisite looking beaches. Country also has a very significant amount uh, of historical pieces as well, including a lot of great museums. And they've just done a tremendous deal in cleaning up Guayaquil, which was a terrible place a long time ago. Uh, but it has, has really picked up tremendously. There's a new Malecon there. But for those that want to go into Quito and see the city of Eternal Spring, remember here uh, in Ecuador, it is the home of Panama hats. Panama hats are not made in Panama. They're actually made in Ecuador. So there's a, a little piece of trivia that you can take back with you. Uh, but Quito is Ecuador's capital. It's a modern city, a lot of Spanish architecture, some really neat culture, a lot of crafts markets that are here. You see that Pinchincha volcano. Just north uh, of the city is a very world famous market called Otovalo. Uh, and the again, the colors and the cultures, and things may repeat themselves a bit, but the buys that you can get here, the people that you can meet, you can try Kui in some of these markets. But the very thing that gives this country its name is the equator. And the equator runs right through here. Mite del Mundo, the middle of the world. And this monument is about one hour north of Ecuador, and you can actually stand with one foot in the northern hemisphere, as they say, and one foot in the southern hemisphere. But those are just some of the really exquisite things that one can see in the country. You would think of Peruvian Amazon. Many do not think of the Ecuadorian Amazon. They've been in this game a long time. Most often it's a fly-in. A lot of the resorts that will be out here have electricity only uh, by generator, but there has been some new ships that have been launched in the last number of years that really present some interesting opportunities. And in, if history has taught me anything in the past, it has taught me that when things of strife happen in our life, we do often go back to simplicity. And in 9-11, uh, during the period of 9-11, I was working for an Ecuadorian company called Quasar Nautica. And we had seven ships in the Galapagos Islands. We chartered them. We had tour operators who were buying space from us. 
I worked out of our office in Miami and we had a full on operation. In fact, Abercrombie and Kent chartered their ship from us at Quasar Nautica. So I had a lot of time to spend in the Galapagos. I got to know the destination very well and we just blew up right after 9-11 when people just wanted to get away and go someplace. That was so different and so extraordinary and my gut's telling me that that's going to happen because folks, we live to travel, we travel to live. It is one and the same for many people who want to travel to these places. Travel is as important to us as breathing. So when the time comes and you want to go to Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands, you fly in internationally, you can go to Quito, that city of eternal spring, and I highly recommend it for two to three days, either pre or post. Spend some time in this country. Most planes that are coming from Ecuador going out to the Galapagos Islands will touch down in Guayaquil so that they can fuel up, provision up, then they fly out to the Galapagos Islands where they land on the airfield that was built by the Americans. And that airfield and that base that was there protecting the Panama Canal. So it's pretty neat to think that when you fly in on an aircraft here, they'll put down, take their provisions off, you'll get off the plane, folks will get on, they'll take everybody back to the mainland, usually touch down at Guayaquil, and then go back up to Quito after remembering that Quito is at a higher altitude of 9,000 feet. And I share details like this with you because you, my travel partners, the devil is always in the details. And when you're looking to come to a destination like this, you may be combining Peru and Ecuador, the Galapagos and Machu Picchu, nothing is mutually exclusive. So understanding how some of the air routes run and knowing that you've got vendors and people that you can count on to field some of these questions for you is a pretty big deal. And I look at that image in front of you. I was in the Galapagos Islands. That is Post Office Bay. On my left is Bolivar Sanchez. On the right hand side is, and his name just went out of my head. Isn't that often? It'll come to me. These two guys still work in the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. They are still naturalist guides. They're level three naturalist guides, which means an awful lot of things in this part of the world. It means they not only speak English as a second language, but they have university degrees, a certain level of experience. And when you go to the Galapagos Islands, nowadays you can uh, get on the boat. There's land hotels here as well. But 97% of the archipelago's national park. There's 13 major islands, seven smaller islands. And I'm going to go back to the map here so you can see them. You're about 1,000 miles or so off the coast of South America. It's not a long flight. It's just about two hours out. 13 big islands, seven smaller ones, a whole bunch of islets, and there's always people arguing about exactly how many of them there really are at the end of the day. The further you get out and the further north you get, you can see where some of the diving sites are. There are a lot of dive charters that go here. Hammerhead sharks are a favorite. And remember that the Galapagos are volcanic in origin, and in fact, these babies are still volcanic and active today. Uh, it uh, was not that long ago when there was some activity recently where some of the vessels could pull up and watch uh, some of the activity that was going on. But here, when you go ashore in the Galapagos, you'll always have a naturalist guide with you. Groups are usually done in the range of 16 people, so 8, 16, 32, you'll go up to 48. And this was a group that I had a chance to travel with. It is always said, never touch the wildlife, but when the wildlife come and lays on your feet, there's really not a whole lot that you can do about it. Tortoises, turtles, remember tortoises are land turtles. These are, are tortoises are on land, turtles are in the water. Some of these tortoises were the size of Volkswagen bugs. And I remember Bill and he had his Charles Darwin shirt on. And when the tortoise would suck his head in and pull his legs, it sounded like a gigantic vacuum going in and he would drop down onto the grass. And this photograph was up in the highlands in one of the uh, main islands on the Divine Farm, which is a privately held farm. Uh, here in the Galapagos, you go ashore with a zodiac. You can see how easy it is. You got your life jackets. You're probably going to be throwing your feet over the swims were never far and you can see our vessel which back there was the evolution but 
for heaven's sakes, we had 48 passengers on board. My friends, you can book celebrity. Our scenic eclipse comes in, and we have some itineraries that do include using a local vessel here. One of the things in the Galapagos Islands is what's called cupos, and those are licenses for people to be going ashore. And those are very carefully guarded. Uh, and it's sort of like what a, a medallion in New York City used to be. But this is what a beach looks like in the Galapagos Islands, and there are tons of them. Out of all of the islands that we talked about, 13 major islands, seven of them smaller, there's only four that are inhabited. And since 2001, a lot of changes have taken place here. Yeah, yeah, they sure have. I've taken five trips to the Galapagos Islands. I've seen blue-footed boobies. I have seen my share of marine iguanas, and if you have not been snorted on by a marine iguana, then you have not been properly Galapagoized. Charles Darwin had some rather unflattering things to say uh, about these prehistoric creatures. They feed on krill. Uh, it is not uncommon when you may be out in the water to have one of these guys, when you're snorkeling, have them go past you. Just exquisite experiences. Tortoises on the land, there's sea turtles, the marine iguanas, blue-footed boobies, marine, uh, I mentioned the marine iguanas, the red-footed boobies. Pinnacle Rock here on the right is probably one of the best-known rocks. See how it pierces and tilts over to the right-hand side. Certain times of the year, you'll be able to go in and swim and uh, snorkel off of that beach. Other times of the year, you won't because turtles will be in there laying their nests also on the left-hand side of the island. And you may think you're looking at one big island, but folks, that's two. And there's no docks that are here, and great attention is paid to make sure that people get ashore where you can breathe, where it's simplicity, and there are occasions where your cell phone's going to work. But you know what? You shut it off. You leave your cell phone on board the ship, a wonderful hike on one of the islands up to Darwin Lake. You can see how people are dressed. The hikes were not very far. You do a couple of land visits a day, go in and do some snorkeling, some hiking. And the evenings were absolutely exquisite. Someone once said to me to go to the Galapagos is to know that God lives here. And I remember so many things throughout traveling and the things that really live in, in my heart. And even as I look back and see some photographs of myself there over the years, what really remains constant in our life are the things that we create, the experiences we have, the people that we do things with. And the one evening that will always stand out in my mind was this evening on uh, board this vessel when it was sunset time, a full moon was rising on one side and the sun had set on the other side. Blue-footed boobies were diving from the sky. Sea lions were in the water. I had a glass of wine in my hand. And my favorite piece of music is Vivaldi, Four Seasons. And there was a moment when my knees went out from under me when I realized what I was seeing and experiencing and the spectacle of how extraordinary our world is. And may we always continue to have those moments, to create those moments, because they exist for us. And they're out there for the taking. So... As you think about Ecuador or any of the places that we travel to in our armchair series, the first thing I encourage you to do is, oh, let me go back and see if I can, oh, let me see if I can get him to come up a little bit better. That was my beautiful evening. It was just magnificent that night. But, you know, I think our life is really our experiences and it's kind of creating ourself. And I have a little kitty cat, Alfie, who hangs out with me and he is very important in my life. And when I look at the things that matter to me in my life and the traveling that I want to do, and I look back at what I did in Galapagos, here's what I suggest to you. We're here. Pop in a movie. Watch The Galapagos Affair, a wonderful film. I'll bet you didn't know that in the 1930s, there was a crazy German dentist that came over and settled on the islands here and convinced a whole bunch of folks to come over and set up shop with him. You can read all about that story or about that on the Galapagos Affair. Uh, Pescador is also a highly recommended Ecuadorian film. If you want to do something kind of fun, go ahead and make penguin cookies. You can make them for the Antarctic, but we have Galapagos penguins here as well. 
mostly because of that delicious Humboldt current that comes out of the Antarctic and it rides up along South America and it keeps that nice, cold, nutrient fresh water that everybody likes here. Anywhere in South America, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a great read and I highly suggest The Queen of Water if you want to read a little bit more uh, about Ecuador itself. There's that Galapagos affair, hammerhead sharks and tomorrow night, same time, same place. Seven o'clock, here's what I'm thinking to do and maybe we'll take a look at the Panama Canal that transit, whether you do it from the um, Atlantic side over to the Pacific or the Caribbean Sea, if you will, over to the Pacific side. One of the marvels of man where really it goes back to initially this attempting to be dug at sea level, uh, the French effort in here and shares that were issued by the French in order to raise money for them to be able to create this Panama Canal that now connects our world in such an incredible way. Uh, the Miraflores locks uh, that you see here, many folks have done a transit of the canal, whether it's a partial transit or a full transit. Uh, I've had the pleasure of probably doing somewhere around 90 something full transits in all of the years that I worked on cruise ships. So it's a place that really, really I enjoy. So maybe we'll look a little bit at the Panama Canal. Oh, or maybe a little bit at Peru and Machu Picchu because so much of the Incas that uh, what their influence on South America. But I share so much of this because of the influence of my husband, my steward down there at the right hand side who shared his love of travel, his love of history with me. And I get to share some of his stories with you. But perhaps someday I'll have an opportunity to share with you the story of the first Arctic submarine Nautilus. Uh, there was once an Australian explorer by the name of Sir Hubert Wilkins, and he attempted to get to the North Pole by going under the Arctic ice pack. He took a World War I decommissioned submarine, re-outfitted it, and took 30 brave men uh, across the sea up to the coast of the Arctic, uh, really in search of, of glory and fame. Uh, he wasn't successful. The submarine was scuttled, meaning it was sunk in about a thousand feet of water off of Bergen, Norway, and it sat there since 1930. And in 2005, my husband put a dive team together uh, and called Project Nautilus, and they dove on this submarine and brought up some pretty amazing images and video uh, images from a thousand feet below the surface of the ocean. So perhaps I'll, uh, I'll share that story with you a little bit later in the week as well. The one thing that I know is that to travel is to live, and that is what I got to do. Thank you for sharing your time with me this evening. Uh, we've gone to Ecuador. We've taken a little look at the Antarctic. We've talked about the rivers in Europe, maybe some Panama Canal or Peter the Great in the future. But do follow me on Jennifer Reynolds Travels. I will post these videos up to that as well. I may re-record and condense them down a little bit and make a bit shorter. But thanks for traveling with me. And I look forward to working with my travel agent partners to continue to create these dreams of a lifetime for you and for all of our travelers out there. Thanks for joining me. This is Jennifer Reynolds.